Would you open up your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 5? We'll be in uh, Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 17 through 26. Uh, This morning we're continuing our sermon series through the Gospel of Luke. Um, Right now we're in the midst of this seven-segment part of Luke as Jesus is doing ministry. Today is the third of seven segments. Um, You'll remember over the past couple of weeks, um, Pastor Martin began uh, with the calling of the disciples in the first segment and the cleansing of the leper last week. And this week we continue with uh, the healing of the paralytic. Now, this is a story that's probably very familiar to most of you. Um, the most, common, most commonly, it's preached from the Gospel of Mark, but today we'll be in the Gospel of Luke. It's the story of the man who was lowered through the roof and healed by Jesus. Um, the story is very familiar, but there's lots of unique things that are going on in Luke. Um, in the Gospel of Luke, this is the first time that we see the characters of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the scribes appear. This is the first encounter they have with Jesus in the Gospel. Of Luke. This is also the first appearance of the word faith in the Gospel of Luke. This is also the first use of the term Son of Man to describe Jesus. So there's a lot going on in this passage, a lot of firsts. In a lot of ways, this passage is is speeding up and and, um, helping us propel forward through the Gospel of Luke and introducing a lot of new ideas. So uh, let's pray together and then we'll go to the text. Almighty Father, your word is true. You give us your word as a guide on what to believe concerning you and what duties you require of us. And so, Father, would you teach us right belief and right obedience. Father, teach us faith in you and trust in you. Father, by your Holy Spirit, would you illuminate your words to us? Would you show us your will for us? Would you teach us to follow you? We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 17. On one of those days, as he was teaching, that is Jesus, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. Finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed. I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God. And we're filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you. I don't remember where this idea originates. I don't remember who said it. I wish I I did. But someone once said that the central ideology of post-war America after World War II is something called technological teleology. Now, that's a big word. But what that means is the thing that we most hold dear The thing that we believe will save us is technology, inventions, gadgets. And so our solution to all the problems that we have so often is faster cars, faster communication, more efficient technology, faster computers, a better medicine, new um, medical technologies, things like that. And we think that if, if we just kind of brute force it, if we use our, put, all, pull our, put all of our minds together and we think really hard and we think big thoughts and big ideas, that we'll be able to solve all of our problems. But how's that going for you? How's that going for us? 
You know, we've, we've come a really long way. We've got really nice things. We've got really nice buildings. We've got really uh, nice cars. We've got uh, tons of new ways to protect ourselves from the dangers of this world, but we don't have the resources to solve our deepest problems. No matter how much technology and inventions and innovation we have, we still have broken families. We still have terminal illness. We still have animosity and division and hate. And the, the problem is that we haven't reckoned with our own hearts. We haven't reckoned with what's really going on inside of us. That Satan may actually be at work in this world to harm us and to turn us away from God. Because you see, like, all, all of man's efforts are aimed at reversing this curse that we've received through sin. But that curse is supernatural. It's beyond our own power. It's beyond our ability, and there's no human solution. So no matter what our efforts are, we're never going to be able to solve our deepest problems. We need something more than that. And in today's passage, we get the answer to that deeper problem. We get a real solution. It's, it's not something that we muster up in ourselves. It's not some new technology. It's not a new uh, best-selling self-help book. No, the only thing that can help us, the only thing that can save us, that can solve our deepest problems and, and heal our deepest needs is faith. Faith is what makes the difference. So today we'll look at a man who had true faith, even in the face of the so-called faithful Pharisees who had just as soon abandoned him. This paralytic and his friends demonstrate a deep and abiding faith that leads to a deep and abiding freedom in the forgiveness of Christ. So we'll, be, we'll begin by considering their faith before freedom, before forgiveness, and then we'll turn and consider the effects of their faith after freedom. So look at, look at me, look with me at verse 17. Faith before freedom. On one of those days, as he was teaching, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him, in, bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. Now, I want you to imagine this for a moment. A lot of times, because we're so familiar with this story, we miss some of the details of what's going on. The first thing I want you to notice is that what's happening is, is kind of a debate. Luke intentionally sets this up. He says Jesus was teaching in the presence of the teachers of the law. And they are sitting in judgment over Jesus, trying to test what he's saying. Now, these are people that are respected in their communities. These are people that are trusted by uh, the lay people around, by these, these crowds that are coming. And, and all these people have gathered together to see what exactly is going on with this Jesus guy. Is his teaching true? Can we trust him? And so what they're doing is they're having kind of a big Bible study. They've all gathered together. They've filled this room. And they're coming to challenge Jesus and see what he has to say. But then we have outside of the crowd, away from this, these four men, which is, Mark tells us we have four men, bringing their paralyzed friend on a bed to be healed by Jesus. And they encounter their first obstacle to this healing, the crowd itself. But because these men have faith, because they trust that Jesus can heal, they're not going to let that stop them. So they, they hatch this creative and I would consider questionable plan. They say, we're going to go in through the roof. Now imagine being in the room when this happens. A lot of times, again, we think that all of a sudden the, the roof just opened up and the man dropped in. But no, this, this would have taken some time. The, the roof had tiles on top. They had to remove the tiles, and there was probably some clay and dirt to dig, dig through and some straw. And so this is a process. This isn't just a, a quick and easy thing to do. And so we can imagine that maybe someone went up and tried to stop them. Um, everyone in the crowd is probably looking up, including Jesus, wondering what's, about to, what, what's going on on the roof. And 
uh, we can also imagine what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the scribes are thinking. They're probably thinking, this Jesus man, he attracts vandals. We've already seen him with lepers and with the sick. If these are the kind of people that he attracts, can we trust this guy? And so, I don't think they were too pleased with what was going on. But what does Jesus do? They lower the man down. Look at verse 20. Now, verse 20 is the verse where this whole story rotates around. And in verse 20, Jesus says, when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now, from our perspective, this is a really weird thing to do. That's not what the paralytic is obviously asking for. Obviously, the paralytic is asking to be healed of his paralysis. But instead of picking this man up off of his bed, Jesus does something entirely different and something entirely unexpected. He forgives the man's sin. Now, there are a couple things to notice about this. First, it's interesting that Jesus is actually pretty modest about the way he does this. Jesus has absolute power and absolute authority. He could say, I forgive you. I am God, I have the power to forgive you, and I forgive you. But instead he, instead he says, your sins are forgiven. Now there's a practical reason for this. He knows that the Pharisees are waiting to catch him blaspheming. And so he doesn't want to give them extra ammunition to do that. But he's also making a theological point. On some level, he's, he's simply voicing a reality that already exists in this man's life. The man's sins are forgiven because they were already forgiven at the point of faith. When he demonstrated faith in Jesus by asking his friends to take him to the crowd, by, by uh, agreeing to be dropped down through the roof, he'd already demonstrated his faith, and he'd already demonstrated that his sins were forgiven. The second thing to notice is that in the minds of the faithful Jews in this crowd, there's a really close connection between sin, personal sin, and these kinds of serious ailments that people like this deal with. So if you're blind, if you're paralyzed, if you're a leper, then in the minds of these people, it's probably because you've committed some grave sin and God is punishing you for it. Now that's not entirely off base. The reason we, we suffer from death, the reason we suffer from pain and from illness is ultimately because of the curse on Adam. But it's not in our realm, it's not in our um, realm of understanding to, to attempt to point to a specific sin. But Jesus recognizes and affirms the fact that sin is the thing that's at the root of all of our struggles, including our physical ailments and the things that we deal with in the physical world. So he begins not by addressing the external expression of what's going on in the man's heart. Instead, he begins by addressing the paralytic at the root with his sin. Now this reveals some of the errors that we're prone to make. First, we often struggle with our own faith. I, I hear this all the time. People come to me and they say, you know, I want to be a Christian. I want to follow Jesus. I want to have what th these people have, but I'm scared that I don't. And I'm not sure that I do. And if that's you, I want to tell you today that your desire to be at the feet of Jesus is a demonstration of your faith. No matter how deeply you struggle, no matter how weak your faith may be or immature your faith may be, if you are troubled by your lack of faith, that is a demonstration of your faith. And so pray and ask God to strengthen you. Come together with the body of believers and, and have them help strengthen you. But know that if you desire Jesus, your salvation is secure in Christ. You've already demonstrated your faith. The second error we're prone to making is that we often come to Jesus looking for the wrong things. We can come looking for safety or for happiness or for comfort. And those are all good things that Jesus really does offer us. But, but those concerns are only symptoms of a deeper problem. What we really need, if we want all those things, is freedom from sin. And that's the first and the best thing that Jesus gives us. When your sins are forgiven, 
all those other things fall into place. If you seek safety, forgiveness of your sins gives you hope and an eternal security. If you seek happiness, forgiveness teaches you where true happiness can be found. If you seek comfort, forgiveness enables you to have an eternal comfort in Christ. This forgiveness must be taken hold of and received by faith. And so before we have the freedom that Christ offers us in the gospel, we must first come to him in true faith. This is faith before freedom. Next, we'll look at faith after freedom. Remember, the, the passage is rotating around. as the, the center of the passage is verse 20, the forgiveness of sins. And so everything before this has been uh, running up to the forgiveness of sins, and now we're on the other side of it. Look with me in verse 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? And who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up and went before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all and they glorified God. And they were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. So if the first obstacle to this man's healing was this crowd, the second obstacle are the Pharisees and the scribes. Upon the declaration of forgiveness that Jesus offers, an objection is raised. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, interestingly, what the Pharisees don't realize when they ask this question is that they are affirming Jesus' divinity. If, if only God can forgive sins, and this man has just truly forgiven sin, then this man is God. And again, Jesus, because he is God, and because he has power and authority, could have challenged them on that. But he takes their objection seriously. He says, if, if I can forgive sins, surely then I, then I can heal this man's paralysis. Now, from a human perspective, it is much easier to forgive sins. Because we don't have to worry about the external effects. I can say I forgive you, and whether I mean it or not, whether that's true or not, it, it, that doesn't come out externally. So Jesus yields to this assumption while also implying that the really hard thing to do is not the healing of illness, but the healing from sin. And so he does it. He heals the man. He, he saves him from his paralysis. On a deeper level, what Jesus is really doing is making a spiritual reality that is ongoing in this man's heart and making it a physical reality paralytic has already experienced spiritual resurrection but Jesus is going to give him physical resurrection as well. This is in a lot of ways a type a little micro version of the resurrections that we see throughout the New Testament with Lazarus and ultimately with Jesus. This man is as good as dead. He's paralyzed. Clearly he can't walk. He's being carried around. He can't take care of himself. But on the other side of faith, Jesus shows his power to raise the dead. You know, last week we talked about the leper. And in the Old Covenant, what happens is that death spreads like a virus. We have death in us, and the reason you put lepers out of the camp is not because of some public health concern, although we do have public health concerns there. The reason you put the leper out of the camp is because he is manifesting the death that is inside him. Leprosy is death escaping through your skin. It's a, it's a sign of the spiritual deadness inside of us coming out. But in the New Covenant, Jesus reverses this principle. In the New Covenant, it's no longer death that spreads, but life. And so in the case of the paralytic, the spiritual life that Jesus offers him is merely a precursor to his new physical life. There's a renewal in his heart that comes out in renewal of his physical body. But why does it work like that? 
Why this new life? What is the purpose of healing and forgiveness and resurrection? Ultimately, it's for God's glory. What happened after this many resurrection? Well, the paralytic glorifies God, and all who saw it joined in on glorifying God. And healing this man of his disease, Jesus demonstrates the power of God that he has access to. And he calls sinners to glorify the God who heals them. And the way that they do that is by obedience, renewed obedience, renewed faith in God. So a lot of times we think of faith as kind of a one-off thing. You know, you, you do the external things, you say the prayer, you, you take the vows, membership vows, maybe you get baptized. But we all come to a point where we first profess faith, and that's, that's true. But our profession of faith cannot be a momentary commitment. See, after Jesus heals the paralytic, what does he do? He responds in obedience. Jesus forgives his sins, then he says, get up and walk. And without hesitation, immediately, the text says, he obeyed. Now, this is not something he can do under his own power. This is not something that he's ever done, at least in a long time. Because he has faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit empowers him to actually do this. It works the same way for us. God calls us to do all sorts of things that are impossible. We can't obey him. We can't resist temptation. We can't bring ourselves to new life. All of the things that God calls us to are impossible for us in our natural state. But by trusting God in faith, by turning to him, the Holy Spirit renews us and sanctifies us to do all of those things. The Holy Spirit perfects us so that ultimately we can be glorified with Christ and enjoy perfect obedience. So this is the freedom that we have after faith. A freedom to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So if you've professed faith in Christ at one point in your life, don't stop. Keep going. Rely on the Holy Spirit to enable your spiritual resurrection. And by that same power, prepare yourselves for the final resurrection. This is the freedom we have in faith that we get to pursue obedience and holiness in Christ. So today, as we come to the table, that's what the Holy Spirit is preparing you for. New obedience, new faith, and spiritual resurrection. At this table, as we proclaim the death of Christ until he comes, there are promises available for you. As we unite ourselves together in the covenant, there are promises available to you. And your call today is to receive those promises by faith. At this table, God calls you to get up off of your sick bed and to follow him. Without faith, this table is at best meaningless and at worst dangerous. So as you come examine yourselves, recognize your own sin and your own need of a savior. Discern the body of Christ, the body of believers that God has called us into. And by faith, take hold of the promises that he offers you. Take hold of the promises of the covenant and unite yourselves in that covenant to the only one who has the power to resurrect the dead. This is your call today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.